This is a program from the Wapaka Area Public Library. Well, hello, I'm Dick Campbell, and I'm from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And I'm happy to be back with you. I've been here many times in the past oh, five or six years, I think. But I, I have uh, a number of what I call great moments in history presentations. Uh, I have 13 now. Uh, that I developed since 1999. And is there anybody in the audience that has not been to one of these Lunch and Learn programs? Okay. 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 Uh, <clears throat> good to have you here today. <clears throat> because today I want to share one of these stories with you entitled The Lost Squadron and the Resurrection of the P-38 Glacier Room. 78 years ago, on July 7, 1942, a flight of eight U.S. Army Air Corps P-38 Lockheed Lightning fighter aircraft and two B-17 Flying Fortress bomber aircraft with a total of 27 crew members on board them took off from Goose Bay, Labrador headed for England. And what followed was a harrowing and life-threatening landing of the entire squadron on a remote ice cap in Greenland. None of the crew was lost at that time, and all were rescued and returned safely home after spending 10 days on the desolate ice cap. The story of this mission and the recovery of one of the P-38s is a fascinating bit of history. It was just seven months since the December 7, 1941 Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had thrust the United States into World War II. When a Europe first policy was declared by then President Franklin Roosevelt in the early stages of, a war, of the war, a massive buildup and movement of Allied aircraft into the European theater of operation began its phase in history. It was codenamed Operation Bolero. And this became the preferred route of aircraft delivery because at the beginning of World War II, 38% of seagoing aircraft shipments across the North Atlantic were being sunk by German submarines. The most daring aspect of Operation Bolero was the actual flight of aircraft overseas in stages, refueling at newly constructed air bases at Goose Bay, Labrador, BW-1 at Narsarsawak, Greenland, and Reykjavik, Iceland. None of the pilots of what became known as, as a lost squadron, anticipated that their flight to England would end up on the ice cap in Greenland. Flying to these bases was tricky, as the high latitudes played havoc with compasses and radios. Incidentally, Colonel Paul Tibbets commanded the very first successful flight of Operation Bolero in 1942, and later gained fame as the pilot of the B-29 aircraft, the Enola Gay, that dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan on August 6, 1945. Shortly into their flight, stormy weather separated the two formations, codenamed Tomcat Green, which consisted of four P-38s, followed by following a B-17 named Big Stoop, and the other formation, codenamed Tomcat Yellow, which consisted of four P-38s, following a B-17 named Doo Doo. <laughs> this photo was taken from one of the B-17s during their flight, hopefully, to England. Because of weather problems, both formations had to return 
to U.S. airfields at Goose Bay, Labrador, and VW-8 at Sonderstorm, Greenland, respectively. <clears throat> then, on July 15, after rejoining with each other at VW-8 Air Base, the squadron took off for Reykjavik, Iceland, minus two P-38s, which had mechanical difficulties. Over the North Atlantic at 12,000 feet, they again hit heavy weather and received word that the airfield at Reykjavik was closed. They turned back, only to hear that the airfield back at BW-8 was now also socked in and closed. They then attempted to fly back to BW-1, but a phantom message, possibly from a German submarine near Greenland, advised them that this field was now socked in. Here's a great picture of the BW-1 airbase at Narsarsawak, which will give you an idea why anyone landing there would prefer very clear weather. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was in heavy use during the war. This is what it looks like from the cockpit on final approach to BW-1's 6,000-foot runway. And incidentally, during World War II, an estimated 10,000 aircraft landed in Narsarsawak on their way to Reykjavik and beyond. With no navigational fix at all, the P-38s, they, they then flew in circles, as shown as in, in this actual photo taken by one of the P-38 pilots, Lieutenant Brad McManus. The temperature inside the unheated aircraft was 10 degrees below zero. And by now, the airmen had been aloft for more than eight hours. And the P-38, whose range was shorter than the B-17s, no longer had enough fuel to reach any airfield. The pilots of Tomcat Green and Yellow had to land somewhere while they still had fuel to do so, through whatever opening in the clouds they could find. One by one, the P-38s came down on the ice cap, shown here, <clears throat> on the southeast coast of Greenland, just south of the Arctic Circle, and 10 miles from the Denmark Strait. 19-year-old Brad McManus decided to go in first. He chose to land wheels down to enable a possible takeoff later on after more fuel was dropped to him. Well, things went well for the first couple of hundred yards, and then the front, of, front nose wheel buckled, and in a single sickening motion, eight tons of aircraft flipped heavily on its back. Hanging upside down in absolute darkness inside of his cockpit, McManus managed to cut his way out of its parachute harness and release his safety belt as smoke filled the cockpit. He was uninjured and waited on the wing for his fellow pilots to land. The remaining pilots came in for successful wheels up landing on the ice cap. Lieutenant Harry Smith was the last to land. He feathered his propellers and shut down his two engines. The only damage to him was that one blade on each side was bent back. And even though he was in the middle of nowhere, Smith dutifully filled out his checklist and threw the keys to the P-38's canopy on his seat inside the cockpit before joining the other downed pilots. The two B-17s with their greater fuel capacity, remained aloft for, half, for a half an hour, sending out SOS signals without receiving a reply at that time. Finally, 
they skim the B-17s, skim smoothly around, along the ice, bending their props, but otherwise landing undamaged. Having made successful landings, all without injury, within a radius of one and a half miles of each other, the job at hand for the 25 crew members was survival and rescue. They continually sent out SOS calls. And after three days, their distress call was finally heard and a fix was made on their position. Overflying planes from nearby Kulalusik Air Base brought supplies to sustain them. They camped out on the ice for 10 days using the B-17s for shelter. A rescue sled dog team with supplies was sent to lead them the 17 miles to the southeast coast line. They were then picked up by the Coast Guard cutter, the Northland. And after being dropped off at BW-1 Air Base, they were debriefed and later sent back to the United States to new military assignments. Well, not long after the rescue of the crew, 33-year-old Norman Vaughn, an Army Air Corps Arctic specialist, traveled along by, alone by sled dogs to the crash site of the downed aircraft. <coughs> His mission was to retrieve highly sensitive equipment, the Norden bomb site from the B-17s, to hopefully prevent their falling into enemy hands. For more than 35 years after Vaughn's visit, the eight airplanes sat on the desolate ice cap, abandoned and apparently forgotten. They would come to be known as the lost Squadron, the largest force landing and rescue in U.S. aviation history. Excuse me for just a moment. Incidentally, from June to July 1942, Operation Valero <coughs> moved 300 and 86 aircraft across the North Atlantic. By the end of the year, that number climbed to 882 planes, safely making the journey. In all, 38 aircraft were lost during the 1942 Operation Valero movements, roughly 10%, just as Army Air Force planners had predicted. Then, 35 years later, in 1977, the memory of the landing of the Lost Squadron in Greenland was revived through a chance meeting between Carl Rudder, one of the Lost Squadron P-38 pilots, shown here in 1942, and Roy Deacon, a commercial airline pilot. Their conversation about the Lost Squadron set in motion an opportunity for the adventure of a lifetime for aviation buffs and adventure seekers. From 1981 to 1985, several small groups made trips to the ice cap in unsuccessful efforts to pinpoint the location of the downed plane. One of them, shown here, was the Winston Recovery Team in 1943. However, a course of research in the government records, interviews with the pilots, use of subsurface radar, photographs, and seat of the pants logic yielded enough information to make another major effort in 1986. There is hope the ice and snow has preserved the aircraft enough for them to be repaired and flown away. The Greenland Expedition Society, known as GES, 
founded in 1981 by Pat Epps and Richard Taylor, shown here, received exclusive rights of search and salvage from the Ministry of Greenland and the Government of Denmark on April 23, 1986. Any extension of these rights dependent, dependent on the fulfillment of conditions as set forth on this communication number 16505 shown here. The purpose of the 1986 GES program was to first locate electronically, <coughs> then physically by steam probe and auger one of the airplanes. Next, a digging process would begin to visually determine its physical condition and feasibility of extraction. A decision would be made as to how to excavate the plane, either by taking it apart or enlarging a tunnel ramp to haul it to the surface. An initial recovery plan involved, shown here, involved a coring operation which would physically determine the depth of the plane and then a tunnel would be constructed so as to intersect the aircraft at a 30 degree angle, shown here. At that time, estimates of the depth of the aircraft varied from about 40 to 120 feet. After a summer of searching and probing unsuccessfully for a plane, Epson Taylor shot down the 1986 expedition. In total, six expeditions had gone to the ice cap in as many years, and it was a matter of conjecture whether anyone had so much as detected objects that might be the airplanes. Having spent approximately $300,000 thus, thus far, Epps and Taylor were financially overextended, and the quest seemed more improbable than ever. Another trip was planned for the summer of 1988, and Epps came up with a brand new financing scheme for $25,000 would-be investors received 4% of the company and a one-eighth share in a P-38. A realist might point out that this really amounted to 4% of a company that was worth nothing and one-eighth of a plane that might not be retrievable or even exist. But Epson Taylor preferred to focus on the positive. <laughs> Since a refurbished B-38 had recently sold for $800,000, there was every reason to believe a P-38 from the legendary Lost Squadron could fetch over a million dollars. Of the project's investors, Epps would say, quote, they are people who can afford to lose $25,000 without going out of business and there's a chance of finding the airplanes. So did we sell them a bill of goods? No, we sold them a piece of a tree." <laughs> Unquote. One thing was certain. If the planes weren't located <laughs> this time, the Greenland Expedition Society wasn't going to be searching for history. It was going to be history. <laughs> In 1988, the Greenland Expedition Society had attracted the attention of thousands of aviation and history enthusiasts. The expedition leaders contacted Dr. Helgi Bjornsson at the University of Iceland, who had developed a low-frequency subsurface radar device for locating objects below the ice, and it enlisted his help. Using the sophisticated radar, along with the coordination taken from the pilot's logs, the group believed they had pinpointed the locations of all eight aircraft. And immediately it became obvious why they hadn't been located earlier. The shifting ice glacier had carried the airplanes about one 
to two miles southeast from their original location. <coughs> Still unsure of the exact depth at which the aircraft rested, they enlisted the use of a newly developed steam probe. This high pressure device proved capable of melting straight down through the ice rather quickly. Finally, success at nearly 268 feet, 27 stories, the metal tip of the probe thumped on something solid. It could only be an airplane. Epps, Taylor, and their team returned from the 1988 expedition elated. They had confirmed the location of the aircraft and had marked them using satellite navigational fixes as well as physical markers. The terms of their search and salvage rights required that they provide tangible evidence of the planes by 1989. The 1989 expedition was the most ambitious to date, with Gordon Scott as the team leader. The logistics of transporting a large number of people to the ice cap and setting up camp became much more complex. One of the expedition team mem members designed and fabricated a coring device, which would be able to cut a small hole in an airplane and retrieve a piece of it. Mm -hmm. Using the steam probe, the team made a four inch diameter hole in the ice all the way down to one of the airplanes. Lined the hole with plastic pipe and then inserted the coring device. On July 15, 1989, Seven years to the day from when the Lost Squadron went down, the team brought up a small piece of metal tubing from the B-17 known as Big Stoop to the surface from 268 feet below the ice cap. They now had tangible evidence of the aircraft. They could now create a shaft large enough for a team member hopefully, to descend and physically examine the condition of the aircraft. One of the team members, Don Brooks, originated the concept for melting a four-foot shaft with a device he called a thermal meltdown generator, pictured here, later called the Super Gopher. This was a 500 and 50 pound cone shaped apparatus in which hot liquid was circulated through copper coils to melt the ice. Brooks also contributed the use of his ski equipped DC 3 aircraft, which became the official Greenland Expedition Society airplane to transfer supplies and people to and from the site. Incidentally, this aircraft built in 1942, pictured here, took part in the D-Day invasion of June 6, 1944, by dropping paratroopers behind enemy lines several hours before troops landed on the Normandy beaches. It was also, it also was rebuilt by Basler Flight Services of Oshkosh in 1986. The retrieval of pieces of the Lost Squadron aircraft attracted worldwide media attention. The major television network, wire services, newspapers and magazines carried stories of the expedition's breakthrough. People from around the world wanted to get involved and be part of this historic an ex ex exciting adventure. Contributions were encouraged and mementos were sold like photos, earrings shaped like a P-38, 
which I have a set that I gave to my wife, Marla. <laughs> and she wears them whenever we go to an aviation event. <laughs> and ball caps and t-shirts to help defray some of the costs of the 1989 and 1990 expeditions. The goal of the 1990 expedition was to open shafts <coughs> down to several of the buried aircraft, send team members down to them, hollow a cavity around each plane, and begin raising them to the surface. After overcoming many logistical problems, the Super Gopher began melting its four-foot shaft over B-17 Big Stoop. On June 6, 1990, it stopped its downward journey with a thump. It was resting on Big Stoop. And that day, the expedition met one of its biggest disappointments. After team members descended the shaft to examine the old warbird B-17, they op opened a cavity around the plane using steam wands. They discovered that the B-17 had been badly crushed by the weight of the ice above it. <coughs> Yet team members were able to get into the cockpit and actually sit on top of the pilot's seats. Those seats were removed, along with the instrument panel, the top machine gun turn, and two machine guns, the power control quadrant, the control yoke, radio and navigation instruments, identification plates, oxygen masks, and, and several Lucky Strike tobacco tins. <laughs> Incidentally, while the team members were at Big Stoop, they noticed a name painted on the fuselage just under the pilot's window. The name was Phyllis Arlene, pilot Joe Hanna's wife. They cut out the section of metal and brought it to the surface. In November 1990, Pat Epps and Richard Taylor presented that piece of metal to Phyllis Arlene Hanna on NBC's Today program. And in exchange, Mrs. Hanna gave the two explorers the keys to the crew entrance to the B-17 that her husband had brought home with him after the war. Joe Hanna passed away in 1981. Reasoning that the smaller, more sturdily built P-38s would be in better condition, the team members set the sights of their next expedition on Harry Smith's plane, the only one shown in 1942 photographs to have survived with its propellers both intact and slightly bent, because Smith had feathered them before landing. Unfortunately, the society, which had spent about $1.5 million to get to that point, did not have enough money for a return trip in 1991. Then Roy Schaffner, a Middlesbrough, Kentucky businessman, came along with the necessary $350,000 for the 1992 operation which was the 10th expedition to date. He had followed the society's adventures from afar, and he became intrigued by the engineering problem of salvaging an airplane from beneath the ice cap. It seemed like a good omen that the trip would put them on the ice cap at the exact 50-year anniversary of the crash landing in 19. 42. Here's an aerial shot <coughs> of the 1992 expedition site. <coughs> the 
in May of 1942, the team sent the Super Gopher down to reach the aircraft by melting one four-foot diameter shaft after another in a row until there was one big shaft about 12 feet wide and 268 feet deep. It took eight days to reach the target. Here you see workers preparing Gordon Scott for a descent into the gopher hole. And being a little problem with going in, in the tight places, that's something I don't think I'd want to do. Here is Scott about to be winched down in a bosun's chair through 268 feet of the icy gopher shaft through the aircraft. Once the crew reached Harry Smith's P-38, hot water was shot out of a water cannon to enlarge the cavern. Some pumps at the bottom drained the great puddles and pushed the water back up the shaft. After three weeks of work, the plane was uncovered, as shown here. The good news was that it was salvageable. 268 feet under the total height. The cockpit looked much as it did 50 years ago. The propellers were good, and the original armament was intact. In fact, the, the four cow 50 caliber machine guns and the 20 millimeter cannon on the airplane were fired with their 50 year old ammunition once recovered and brought to the surface of the glacier ice cap. There was still air pressure in the tires and still oxygen in the oxygen box. They then dismantled the plane and hauled it in parts to the top of the shaft. An interesting moment occurred while they were dismantling one of the radiator scoops of the plane. When the scoop fell into the worker's hand, he noticed something drawn on the primer paint. He saw a crude caricature of a Japanese face with huge ears. Clearly inspired by the wartime phrase, quote, loose lips sink ships, end quote, it had been signed by two workers assembling this P-38 in Lockheed's Burbank, California factory back in 1942. It was one of those small human touches that can reach across a half a century. After the men, after most of the parts of the plane, except the center section, were pulled up and out of the shaft, they were flown by the DC-3 to nearby Kulusik Air Base, shown here. Then, the parts were flown to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to be exhibited at the EAA's annual Air Venture Convention that began that year on July 30, 1992. The Greenland Expedition Society had rented a prime location at EAA with the promise that they would, <coughs> would be showing parts of the first Lost Squadron plane rescued from its icy tomb. Here are some pictures of the P-38 that I took at the Oshkosh exhibit back in 1992. Among the parts on display were one engine, the right hand wing, the top of the canopy, the left and right tail boom, the nose, and the two propellers. Expedition members said this P-38 was in the best condition of the six under the ice because of the skill of its pilot, Harry Smith. Harry Smith died back in 1990. It then 
took the remaining crew of seven men working back on the Greenwood ice cap for 18 days to drag up the P-38's hulking 7,000 pound center section. The shaft had to be enlarged to 20 feet across and five feet wide with the melting unit. <clears throat> a Sikorsky S-61 heavy-duty cargo helicopter then picked it up and hauled it to nearby Kululusik Air Base at a cost of $75,000. Two weeks later, the section was loaded on a Danish ship that carried it to Denmark, and from there it was shipped to Sweden, where a freighter picked it up and delivered it to the docks at Savannah, Georgia. The piece was then carried by truck to Middlesboro, Kentucky, where it was be, to be rebuilt in Roy Schaffner's hangar. The total cost to date to get it there was about $640,000. Restoration of the Glacier Bureau, as the resurrected plane was renamed, started in October of 1992. <coughs> when all the parts were finally gathered together. For the next two and one half months, under project director Bob Carden's supervision, <coughs> here, specialists started taking the plane completely apart, starting with the plane's massive center section. Each piece was carefully checked. Undamaged parts were cleaned, while damaged ones were repaired or replaced. Bullet holes had damaged key components near the radiator where the pilot, Harry Smith, with his 45 caliber pistol, had destroyed the IFF identification friend or foe radio back in 1942 to keep the radio, hopefully, from enemy hands. The two Allison 1225 horsepower engines were good. Both props were restorable. Fuel cells would need to be replaced along with all new cockpit gauges. Each day brought new challenges, finding existing parts from other 1942 aircraft, finding experts to work on the plane, and searching for blueprints, tools, and machines to do the job. In the spring of 1993, the crew began to rebuild the plane using the main spar as the starting point. When this P-38 went down in 1942, it was only 62 days old and had only 74 total hours of flight time on it. It was virtually brand new and built to very high standards. To make sure everything fit properly and no pieces were overlooked, each component was first attached using clecos, which are temporary fasteners that resembled bullets. Once a part checked out, the crew bolted or riveted the piece into place. Many components were restored by companies donating their services or charging a nominal sum. Carden discovered that people were eager to contribute to so unique a project. The restoration crew members worked seven days a week along with Carden. The P-38 Lightning was one of the most unusual aircraft to come out of World War II. Designed in 1937, by two Lockheed engineers, Kelly Johnson and Paul, Paul Hilbert, Hibbert, pictured here with three other engineers. The aircraft had two engines with counter-rotating propellers and a unique twin-boom airframe that prompted its German adversaries to call it the Fork-Tailed fork Devil capable of slightly more than 400 miles per hour, 
It was the fastest airplane in the skies at the beginning of World War II. Some 9,923 P-38s were manufactured in this Burbank, California plant. But only seven remained in flying condition back in about, about four or five years ago. Price per plane in 1941 was $97,147. Restoration efforts continued throughout the 1990s, slower than originally estimated. Cardinal thought it would take about 18 months and $600,000 to do the job. As the restoration aged forward, the legend grew. The hangar was open to anyone who wanted to stop by, and eventually, eventually 50,000 people a year were coming through. <laughs> Pictured here is one of the visitors, Brad McManus, on the ice cap in 1942, above right hand picture, and examining the nose of the P 38 Glacier Girl in May 1994, 52 years later. McManus passed away at age 88 in 2011 the last of the living Lost Squadron crew members. By early 2001, Glacier Girl was up on her main landing gear and nose wheel. Tubing had been replaced, turbochargers were ready, and it was looking very much like the factory new fighter plane it was in 1942. It was destined to be one of the most original warbird restorations in aviation history. On September 6, 2001, the engines were fired up at the Middlesbrough Airport, turning propellers for the first time since 1942. Finally, almost 10 years after the airplane arrived in Middlesbrough, it was time. Glacier Girl was finished, restored, with 80% of its original parts at a cost of over $3.15 million. On October 26, 2002, veteran Warbird pilot Steve Hinton started up the engine, then checked that all the instruments were in order. He taxied out to the 3,600-foot runway and then, for the first time in 60 years, lifted Glacier Girl into the skies over Middlesboro, Kentucky. Perhaps even more remarkable, 20,000 people from around the country showed up that day, clapping and cheering as Hinton winged over the tiny airport. After a 30-minute flight, Hinton came in for a successful smooth landing. This was the only World War II fighter plane still flying with its original engines, propellers, landing gear, and guns. It's exactly as it left the factory in 1942, even down to the Sherwin-Williams paint cover of the plane. In 1992, it was just a pile of many parts when it arrived in Oshkosh. In 2002, 10 years later, it was down to one. Fully restored, Glacier Girl was the center of attraction at EAA Oshkosh Air Conventions from 2005 to 2014. She was on display throughout the week at each convention for visitors to get a close-up view of this amazing restoration. Pilot Steve Hinton in Glacier Girl made several solo demonstration flights during the weekly air show program each year at Oshkosh. He also flew in a heritage formation flight with clockwise a P-51, an F-4 
Phantom and an F-16, with Glacier Girls leading that four plane squadron. Here you see two framed pictures showing Glacier Girl after 50 years under 268 feet of the Greenland ice cap in 1992 on the left, and the amazing resurrection of her flying again <clears throat> in 2002 on the right. Following Roy Schaffner's death, following Roy Schaffner's death on September 24, 2005, Glacier Girl was sold in 2006 to the Lewis Aeronautical Company in San Antonio, Texas. Owner Rod Lewis is pictured here in the cockpit of Glacier Girl with Bob Harden checking him out. Back in September 2010, Glacier Girl led a formation of five of the world's seven, at that time, remaining airworthy P-38s at two air shows in California, the largest gathering of P-38s in 60 years at that time. In closing, I wish to dedicate this presentation to the following. To the members of the legendary Lost Squadron, the pilots and crews of flights Tomcat Green and Tomcat Yellow, and to all the people involved in the discovery, recovery, and restoration of P-38F Glacier Girl. Circled here on this 1942 aerial photo of the ice cap is uh, the picture of Glacier Girl when it was on the ice cap in the lower right hand corner. And I thank you again for your interest in what I like to refer to as another great moment in history. And I thank you.